Good afternoon, everyone. Recording has started. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to uh, Multidisciplinary Endocrine Conference. Uh, it is a uh, pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Prasanthi Gundam. Uh, Dr. Gundam is uh, did her um, went to medical school at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, she then did her internship and residency uh, here in Louisville at the University of Louisville and Norton Children's Hospital. Uh, then she then followed up with that um, with at SU Virginia in pediatric endocrinology here. Uh, uh, at the end of 2019. Um, Dr. Gundam has a number of professional interests and um, I am very pleased to see um, her, uh, what I hope to see a growing interest in uh, breast disease. She's one of our lead physicians in uh, the uh, metabolic bone clinic. Very properly today, she is going to be talking about uh, pediatric metabolic bone disease, uh, which she titled Rickets, Osteoporosis, and OI. Oh my. Uh, please welcome Dr. Gundam. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, without further ado, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. But first of all, I have no financial disclosures. Um, so the objectives for today's talk include to review the basic anatomy and physiology of bone, to review common pediatric bone disorders, to review risk factors for bone disease in children, and to discuss known and emerging therapies for pediatric bone disease. So as endocrinologists, we all know that bone really plays much more of a role than simply providing mechanical support to the body. It's a highly specialized, dynamic, connective tissue, um, and in addition to serving as the body's major reservoir for calcium and phosphorus, of course, more recently it's been, come, um, it's been recognized as a true endocrine organ. So in that capacity, we know that it plays major roles in renal phosphate handling and even in glucose metabolism via its production of both FGF23 and osteocalcin. So I wanted to take a little bit of time to kind of quickly re review um, bone anatomy and physiology, not actually calcium homeostasis, sorry about that. Um, so the bones, specifically the long bones, are made up of three anatomic regions, which include the diaphysis or the shaft of the long bone, the metaphysis, which also includes the growth plate, and then the epiphyses, which is sort of the articular surface of the bone. Um, in growing children, the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate consists of a layer of hyaline cartilage, which is the site of endochondral bone formation. Um, you can really break bone down into its macroscopic components and its microscopic components. So at the macroscopic level, bone can be either cortical or trabecular. And the vast majority of our skeleton is made out of cortical bone, about 85% of it. Um, and this cortical bone is typically found in the shaft of long bones um, and then surrounding trabecular bone. It tends to be much more dense than trabecular bone. Trabecular bone, in contrast, is found at the end of long bones and the vertebrae and then in flat bones such as the pelvis. And it has a much higher degree of porosity as compared to cortical bone. We all know that form and function tend to go together. So cortical bone tends to function mainly as mechanical support, whereas trabecular bone is highly metabolically active and it serves as the major site of hematopoiesis. Um, at the microscopic level, bone can be broken down um, cortical bone specifically can be broken down into osteons um, and each of these individual osteons has at its center a haversian canal through which the blood uh, the bone gets its blood supply um, and each haversian canal is surrounded by concentric lamellae um, and these lamellae consist of bundles of collagen fibrils the really interesting thing is that all of the neighboring lamellae um, have a different fibril arrangement and so this tends to create a sort of twisted plywood arrangement, and that is what gives cortical bone its strength. So we've already referred to the fact that bone is a dynamic tissue, um, and it's remodeled throughout life, allowing for the repair of any microstructural damage that has accrued over time. Um, but 
During childhood alone, we also have a distinct process that goes on, which is called modeling. Um, and modeling is what allows for endochondral ossification and long bone growth at the growth plate. And it also allows for the subtle shaping and reshaping of bones over time. So both of these processes are highly regulated. Remodeling um, occurs via the tight coupling of osteoblastic and osteoclastic function, whereas modeling um, again occurs via the actions of osteoblast and osteoclast, but in an uncoupled fashion. So the various bone cell types that are involved in bone formation and bone resorption include the osteoblast, which is responsible for new bone formation, um, and that's these little purple uh, cells that you can see in the picture. Um, so osteoblasts synthesize and secrete bony matrix, um, and they also uh, secrete calcium salt. As the matrix around these osteoblasts calcify, the osteoclasts become trapped, and then they turn into osteocytes, which are responsible for maintaining this bony matrix. Osteoclasts, of course, um, which are these little sort of mushroom-shaped uh, red cells, are responsible for bone resorption. The osteoblasts are derived from hem the hematopoietic stem cell line, whereas osteoclasts are derived from the mesenchymal uh, stem cell line. Um, so obviously this process of bone formation or resorption is one that's highly regulated, um, and it's regulated through the rank, rank ligand and osteoprotogerin um, system. So rank ligand is part of the superfamily of tumor necrosis factors, um, the ligands and receptors, and it tends to be expressed on the osteoblastic cells. Uh, rank ligand binds to its receptor rank, which is present on osteoclast precursors, um, and this binding of rank ligand to rank is what stimulates differentiation of the precursor cells into mature osteoclasts. Um, and it also has a role in regulating osteoclast survival. Osteoprotogerin, which is also secreted by osteoblasts, as well as the osteogenic stromal cells, um, they serve as a decoy receptor, essentially, for rank ligand. Um, and so they prevent rank ligand from binding to rank, thereby preventing excessive bony resorption. So the process of bone resorption is, in effect, um, regulated in part by osteoblasts. Um, and then the ratio at any time, given time in your blood or in your bone marrow of osteoprotogerin to rank ligand is what determines um, your bone mass in physiologic as well as in pathologic states. So we're going to move on to the next part of our talk, which is a discussion of rickets. Um, so I always think it's interesting to just kind of uh, look back at medical history. So um, rickets really in the 19th century could be described as nothing more than a scourge. Uh, autopsy studies that were conducted in both Boston and in the Netherlands demonstrated rickets in about 80 to 90 percent of children. Um, in 1822, Sniadecki recognized that you could actually prevent and cure rickets by exposing children to sun. Um, and it was almost 100 years later that we finally um, recognized that you could prevent rickets in puppies by giving them cod liver oil. Um, and the next year, we discovered that Foltzinski discovered that exposing children to radiation from either a mercury arc or a carbon arc lamp could actually effectively treat rickets. Um, but it wasn't until a few years later um, that the nutritional factor that was, in fact, preventing or treating rickets was clearly identified and given a name, and that name is vitamin D. Um, and then finally, in 19, the 1930s, vitamin D was able to be inexpensively synthesized, and it was added to milk. And it wasn't really until that point in time, from a public health standpoint, that we were able to dramatically decrease the prevalence and the incidence of rickets. So what is rickets exactly, and how does it differ from osteomalacia? So rickets is the deficient mineralization of the growth plate as compared to osteomalacia, which is deficient mineralization of the bony matrix as a whole. Now, in general, rickets and osteomalacia tend to occur together as long as the growth plates are open. So by definition, once you have epiphyseal fusion, then rickets cannot occur. And so only osteomalacia presents in adulthood, whereas rickets is a disease of children. 
The overall incidence of rickets right now is unknown, um, but interestingly, the incidence is thought to be increasing again worldwide, including in developed nations. Um, and rickets, of course, can be either calcipenic or phosphopenic, um, with vitamin D deficient or nutritional rickets being the most common cause of rickets worldwide. So as far as the etiologies of rickets are concerned, um, calcipenic rickets, uh, as I alluded to, most commonly is caused by vitamin D deficiency. Um, you can much more rarely have rickets due to dietary calcium deficiencies. Um, and then you can also have underlying genetic etiologies for calcipenic rickets, which would include uh, one alpha hydroxylase deficiency, which was formerly known as vitamin D dependent rickets. Or you can have what was formerly known as vitamin D resistant rickets, which is a vitamin D receptor mutation. Um, of course, one alpha hydroxylase is the enzyme that's important for conversion of 25 hydroxy vitamin D to the active form of vitamin D, which is 125 uh, dihydroxy vitamin D. So we see that in all forms of calcipenic rickets that you will expect to have um, a low phosphorus level. Calcium levels may be low or normal. There is um, an elevated PTH level. Um, and al alkaline phosphatase levels are often increased as well. Um, so really the way that we differentiate between these different forms of calcipenic rickets is by looking at the vitamin D and the calcitriol levels. So in vitamin D deficient rickets, we would expect the vitamin D level to be low, um, but the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level can be either low or normal. In one alpha hydroxylase deficiency, you have a normal vitamin D level, but because you cannot convert the vitamin D to 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, um, that level is low. And then in vitamin D receptor defects, you can have um, a normal vitamin D level, and then the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D level is significantly elevated because of um, resistance at the receptor level. Uh, phosphopenic rickets can occur due to renal tubular disorders, such as we see in Fanconi syndrome. The most common cause of heritable phosphopenic rickets is X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets. Um, so this is caused by a mutation in the FEX gene, um, which we're not 100% sure why, but we know that this results in FGF23 mediated uh, hypophosphatemia. So you have an increase in FGF23 essentially. There are actually autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive forms of hypophosphatemic rickets, but they tend to be much less common. You can also have hereditary hypophosphatemic rickets with hypercalciuria, um, but again, this is far more uh, uncommon than XLH. So historically, we used to treat X-linked hypophosphatemic rickets just with oral FOS replacement, but we now actually have um, a therapy available, which is burosumab, the monoclonal antibody, which binds to the FGF23 receptor, preventing the binding of FGF23. Excuse me. So clinical manifestations of rickets in general in children tend to be um, pain um, and bone deformity. Um, and there are a number of skeletal findings that can be seen that we can kind of go through. So you can see widening of the metaphyses um, and essentially uh, several joints. So at the wrists, at the knees, at the ankles. Um, you can have craniotabies, which is a softening of the skull bones. It's also known as the ping pong deformity. You can see why when you press into the skull bone, it leaves an indentation, such as when you press on a ping pong ball. Uh, the rachitic rosary occurs because of an enlargement of the costochondral uh, junction. And you can see it's visible here along the anterolateral uh, rib cage. Um, Harrison groove here on the uh, bottom right side of your screen um, occurs because the softened rib bones are essentially being pulled in by the diaphragmatic attachments. You can have bowing of the limbs, including the radius, the ulna, um, and then the femur and the tibia. And then here, right in the center, is a picture of something called looser zones. So you can see this area in the red circle of radiolucency that's surrounded sort of by sclerotic borders. It looks like a fracture. These are not truly fractures, they're pseudo-fractures, um, and they are pathognomonic for rickets. 
So in children in general, rickets is going to present with pain and irritability. You can have marked muscle weakness and decreased muscle, decreased muscle tone. Um, so this can actually result in delayed uh, motor milestones and antalgic gait. Poor growth is an extremely common finding. You can have viscer optosis, which is essentially a displacement of the abdominal viscera that occurs because of um, diffuse sort of muscle hypotonia in the abdomen. Um, and I think I actually saw my first case of viscer optosis yesterday um, in a young lady that I saw in clinic. Um, and then you can have symptomatic hypocalcemia, including hypocalcemic seizure. The hypocalcemic seizure tends to be more common in the kids who are presenting within the first year of life. Um, and then we've touched on a little bit the lab abnormalities that might be seen in nutritional rickets, which include a lower normal calcium, a low phosphorus, low vitamin D levels, elevated PTH. Alkaline phosphatase levels tend to be elevated and they're a very good um, marker of disease activity. They can be used for screening purposes, um, but there are cases of rickets described with normal alkaline phosphatase levels. This might be more common in kids who have um, malnutrition, such as Kwashiorkor uh, syndrome. And so if you have a high clinical degree of suspicion, just based on your physical exam, the alkaline phos level comes back normal, the best thing to do would be to get radiographs of either the wrists or the need to confirm whether there are rachitic changes noted. Um, so there are a number of things that um, are risk factors for vitamin D deficiency that can clue clinicians into the fact that they should perhaps screen a child. Uh, so maternal vitamin D deficiency is one of them. We know that vitamin D crosses the placenta. Um, and so being vitamin D replete during pregnancy is certainly important. Um, in the same vein, an infant who's born prematurely is at high risk for vitamin D deficiency or rickets. Um, the transplacental uh, transfer of vitamin D it tends to be kind of the most critical period for that is the third trimester. Um, so that's part of the reason that prematurity is such a significant risk factor. Um, if you have an exclusively breastfed infant, that's actually one of the most common um, risk factors that we see. Breast milk is obviously wonderful for a child's nutrition, but it actually has a very, very low content of vitamin D in it, about 15 to 50 IU per liter um, of uh, vitamin D is found in maternal breast milk, even in vitamin D replete mothers. And so the recommendation from the American Academy of Pediatrics is actually that any infant who's being exclusively breastfed should be started on vitamin D supplementation with at least 400 IU of vitamin D daily um, by the first month of life, by the end of the first month of life. Obviously, malabsorptive disorders. Um, in general, very few foods have a significant amount of vitamin D in them, but many of them tend to be either fish or meat-based products. And so um, those children or families who follow a vegetarian or a vegan diet can certainly be at risk. Um, so it's important to encourage vegetarian children um, who drink dairy to drink vitamin D uh, supplemented milk or um, their vegan counterparts to have sort of dairy substitutions that are also um, supplemented with vitamin D. Um, inadequate sun exposure, um, and specifically the increasing use of sunscreen lately for prevention of, of skin cancers, is theorized to be one of the reasons that we're seeing um, an increasing incidence in, in vitamin D deficient rickets uh, throughout the world right now. So how do we treat nutritional rickets? essentially with vitamin D replacement. Um, so the replacement of vitamin D is gonna be based on her, the dosing is gonna be based on an infant's age. Um, so infants less than one month old are gonna get 1000 IU daily for about three months. Um, and this can go up to about 6000 IU daily in children who are 12 years or older. You can use DOS therapy as an alternative um, in infants and children greater than three months old. Um, and that would be totally fine. Um, uh, replacement can be with either ergocalciferol vitamin D2 or colocalciferol vitamin D3. But if you are using STOS therapy, it's important to use only D3 just because um, it tends to have a much longer half-life than vitamin D2. Um, children with rickets are at high risk for hungry bone syndrome if you don't adequately replace um, calcium. So uh, I'm sure many of you know that hungry bone syndrome essentially occurs um, or causes the rapid um, and intense, sometimes prolonged hypocalcemia, which can occur after you have um, 
a correction of hypoparathyroidism after, after hyperparathyroidism after a prolonged period of hyperparathyroidism. Um, so we typically will replete kids with 30 to 50, even up to 75 milligrams per kilo per day of elemental calcium um, via diet or supplementation. Um, and then you can expect resolution of rickets to occur within about three months of therapy. Typically, biochemical res resolution occurs much more quickly, so maybe within about a month or so, you should see normalization of the calcium and the phosphorus levels as well as the PTH levels. Um, but the skeletal healing really does not incur, occur until at least about three months of therapy. Um, typically, you want to obtain lab values within two weeks to one month after beginning therapy to ensure that you're having uh, resolution of the hypocalcemia, um, improvements in the alkaline phosphatase and the phosphorus. Um, but you don't necessarily need to get radiographs until at least three months after therapy has begun. And now we're going to move on to um, a discussion of osteoporosis in children. So osteoporosis is defined as low bone mineral density with alterations in the microarchitecture of bone, increased bone fragility, and greater fracture risk. Now in adults, bone mineral density has been shown to be a reliable predictor of fracture risk. Um, with each decrease in the bone mineral density of about one standard deviation below the average, um, resulting in a doubling of fracture risk. Um, so because of that, we're able to sort of easily diagnose osteoporosis or define osteoporosis in adults. Um, if the BMD falls below 2.5 standard deviations of the average value of healthy adults, so a T-score of less than minus 2.5. However, um, for children, um, the story is a little bit different. So first of all, the clinical relevance of uncomplicated low bone mineral density in children remains very difficult to evaluate. We know that children are continuing to accrue bone mass throughout childhood. So about 40% of their bone mass is accrued during adolescence and puberty. They have about 90% of their bone mass uh, by the time they're about 18 to 20 years old. But really, your peak bone mass isn't achieved until maybe you're in your late 20s. Um, and furthermore, we have no concrete evidence that low BMD is a predictor of fracture risk in growing subjects in the same way that it's a predictor of fracture risk in adults. Um, because uh, children's bone mineral density is obviously changing depending on um, where they are in puberty, their age, their gender, body size, and stature, there's not really one normal bone ma mineral density value that we can use in children. Um, so we also have to use, because of this, a completely different um, index for measuring bone mineral density. So as opposed to T-scores, we use Z-scores in children to evaluate their bone mineral density value. So um, this is the difference between the observed BMD value and the reference BMD value, which tends to be, at the very least, age and gender matched. Um, and this value must be corrected to be accurate. So given the difficulties in obtaining accurate densitometric data in children, and given that BMD alone may not be a reliable predictor of fracture um, in children, fracture risk in children, there's not really a clear consensus on a diagnosis of osteoporosis in children that's going to be based solely on BMD criteria. And so osteoporosis in children is defined as essentially having a low bone mineral density in addition to a clinically significant history of fracture. But what is the clinically significant history of fracture? So that would be either two long bone fractures by the age of 10, or three long bone fractures by the age of 19, or the presence of vertebral compression or crushed fractures sustained in the absence of traumatic injury. So these criteria are really based upon expert opinion, so there's still a lot of debate about them, and it's sort of a moving target. Um, sometimes we'll suspect osteoporosis um, in a child who for instance, has a normal BMD value Z-score, um, but who had a compression fracture without there being significant trauma. Um, so that's kind of that. So as far as measuring bone mineral density is concerned, DEXA is still the most widely used measure. It tends to have relatively lower radiation dose. It's widely available. It's quite precise. And in children, we have fairly good normative data, um, and it's reproducible. But the 
you know, the thing that makes DEXA a little bit difficult in children is that it's not truly a volumetric measure. It's in fact a measure of aerial bone density. Um, and because it's an aerial measure, uh, it tends to overestimate density measures in large bones, excuse me, and it underestimates bone density measures in smaller bones. Um, and so if you have a child, for instance, who has short stature, their bone mineral density is often grossly underestimated. And so you actually do have to correct the bone mineral density for height. And there are Z-score calculators available um, through the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, for instance. <clears throat> um, quantitative CT is another modality that could be used to measure bone mineral density in children, though it is not very widely used. Um, mostly because it's not very widely available and there's a much higher radiation dose uh, than DEXA. But the advantage of quantitative CT is that it does in fact give you a volumetric measure of bone density. Um, so the International Society for Clinical Densitometry actually has pediatric guidelines um, and they have specific recommendations for the best sites to get BMD measurements in children, and these include total body less head measurement and a lumbar spine measurement. So the lumbar spine um, specifically uh, tends to be good because it's easy to position children in a way to get reliable measures. It's easily reproducible, and we actually have a fair amount of normative data for the lumbar spine. The total body less head is valuable because it gives you a sense of what overall total bone masses in a child. They specifically state that probably um, the least desirable area to get a bone mineral density measurement in children is actually at the hip. Um, and that's because it tends to be, this tends to be a site where there's quite a lot of variability um, in skeletal development um, across, even in a child who is of the same age and gender. Um, it's very difficult to correctly position children to get an accurate measurement. Um, and there's low reproducibility at the hip. But we find that at a lot of centers, uh, the hip tends to be one of the um, most commonly reported uh, readings, and I'm not 100% sure why. Um, and then as far as the age at which it would be appropriate to begin to get uh, DEXA data, um, the IC ISCD actually says that you can get um, reliable Z-scores in children who are three years or older at the lumbar spine and total body less head, so pretty young. So of course, osteoporosis can be either due to primary or secondary causes. Um, the most common primary cause of osteoporosis in children is osteogenesis imperfecta, which is one of the connective tissue disorders. There is also an entity called juvenile idiopathic osteoporosis, which is quite poorly understood. Um, it has no known cause, um, but it, and it's considered a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, it tends to present most frequently in children who are maybe about two to three years prior to beginning puberty. But what's very interesting about it is it tends to self remit on its own over time once a child has gone through puberty. So secondary causes of osteoporosis in children are very similar to secondary causes, uh, causes of osteoporosis in adults. Of course, endocrinopathies such as hyperthyroidism, Cushing syndrome um, would be uh, among the secondary causes of osteoporosis. Chronic immobilization, as we see in children with CP or neuromuscular disorders, such as Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, infl inflammatory uh, disorders like JIA or SLE, um, anything requiring the use of chronic glucocorticoid therapy, certainly. Um, malabsorptive disorders, um, and then of course, uh, you can have, in addition to glucocorticoid use, other iatrogenic factors such as use of anti-epileptic medications, methotrexate, um, but by far the most common cause of secondary osteoporosis in children and likely in adults is use of glucocorticoids. So uh, osteoporosis tends to present with either vertebral or non-vertebral fractures. Uh, vertebral fractures can often go unrecognized in children. Uh, they don't always present with pain. Um, and so the lack of back pain does not actually rule out a vertebral fracture. Uh, the prevalence of vertebral fractures varies with the underlying disease process. So we know that kids who are on gl uh, glucocorticoid therapy, which tends to have a predilection for trabecular bone in the vertebrae, 
or children with motor disabilities are at the highest risk. So the prevalence of vertebral fractures in kids with uh, on glucocorticoid therapy is about 32%, and maybe about 25% in kids with uh, motor disabilities. It's extremely important to be able to uh, diagnose vertebral fractures in a timely fashion just because if a vertebral fracture is present, that sort of automatically confers a diagnosis of osteoporosis in a child. Um, the most common sites for uh, low trauma fractures in children are the humerus, tibia, forearm, feet, and ankles. Hip fractures are actually very rare, and so if you identify a hip fracture, you should either be looking for um, malignancy or perhaps for a primary disorder such as like fibrous dysplasia of the bone. And then again, important to be aware of looser zones, which are those pseudo fractures that are seen in rickets. If present, it's very important to, to work the child up for rickets as opposed to pursuing a diagnosis of osteoporosis. So how do we evaluate um, individuals who are at risk for osteoporosis? Um, as opposed to individuals who are presenting to you with maybe a history of recurrent fracture. So in children who are at risk, you want to make sure that you're optimizing their bone health essentially. So you want to get vitamin D studies and calcium levels. It's important to get a dietary history and make sure kids are getting an appropriate amount of um, calcium intake and the RDI for calcium actually varies based on your age. And then of course you want to get a fracture history. For individuals who are presenting with recurrent fracture, you want to rule out secondary causes. So are they on any iatrogens? Um, do they have any evidence of any endocrinopathies? History and physical exam, of course, is always going to be paramount. So looking at the growth chart is important. Looking for features of primary osteoporotic disorders, are there blue sclera? Do they have um, body proportion measurements that are not within the normal limits? For instance, uh, what is their stature compared to that of their family members? And then extremely important, again, to consider imaging of the spine to identify whether, of course, there are, um, there are vertebral fractures present. So in children who have impaired, immo impaired mobility, uh, screening spine radiographs are actually recommended by six to eight years at the latest, um, and then every one to two years until growth is completed. For any child who um, is expected to, be, expected to be in glucocorticoid therapy chronically, so three months or longer, then you should consider getting baseline spinal imaging, maybe even a baseline DEXA. Um, and then you want to follow up with imaging at least yearly if they remain on glucocorticoid therapy. So the recommendations for the initial screening with DEXA may vary, again, based on the underlying etiology. Um, in primary osteoporosis, or if you have risk factors for secondary osteoporosis, the ISCD recommends getting DEXA um, at presentation, whereas children who have chronic immobility or significant motor disability, it's recommended to get the initial DEXA at um, initial presentation with fracture likely because children who have chronic immobility are going to have low bone mineral density um, scores if you measure them, um, but we don't necessarily know, again, if that correlates to fracture risk. There's not really any clear guidance as to the frequency or duration of follow-up screening with DEXA. Again, um, it varies by etiology. So for instance, we know that kids who have uh, idiopathic juvenile osteoporosis, this is something that's likely to self-remit over time. However, um, there are certain diagnoses such as anorexia nervosa where uh, low bone mineral density and increased fracture risk persist for even decades um, after diagnosis. The minimum interval um, for obtaining DEXA, DEXA imaging is about six months, um, and that's again to just avoid excess radiation exposure. The general consensus has been to monitor DEXA every six to 12 months for those who are on treatment, and at least yearly for those who are not. Um, and of course, baseline DEXA measurements should always be obtained prior to initiation of therapy. So how do we treat osteoporosis in children? So the initial treatment is always directed at reducing or eliminating any modifiable risk factors um, as much as we possibly can. And the goals of therapy include fracture and scoliosis prevention, uh, improved function, mobility, and of course, reductions in any bone pain. Um, so it's important to ensure adequate daily intake of calcium and vitamin D. 
Um, addressing both obesity and, and underweight is extremely important. And then probably the single most important thing you can do is reduce the activity of any underlying disease causing osteoporosis. Um, and this may even require treatment with iatrogen such as glucocorticoids. So we know that the net benefit of reducing the overall inflammation, um, of improving mobility, of improving any malnutrition that's present, reducing any malabsorptive process likely outweighs the adverse drug effect on the bones. And many of the inflammatory cytokines that are present um, that have a negative effect on bone have a negative effect on bone health because many of them are actually mediated through the rank rank ligand pathway. And then, of course, the role of PT can't be overlooked. Um, and we know that modest increases in skeletal loading result in gains in bone mass. As far as medical therapies are concerned, bisphosphonates are by far the most widely studied agents used to treat osteoporosis in children. They've been used in children for probably about 20 to 25 years, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but in spite of this, they actually remain uh, an off-label therapy for this indication. So bisphosphonates are analogs of pyrophosphate. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And they work by essentially inducing osteoclastic apoptosis and providing an anti-resorptive effect. So bisphosphonates attach to the hydroxyapatite on the surface of the bone. Um, during resorption of the bone, the bisphosphonates are freed from the matrix and they're taken up by osteoclasts, wherein they actually induce osteoclastic apoptosis. So you can have either nitrogen-containing or non-nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates, with the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates being far more potent than their non uh, non-nitrogen containing um, counterparts. So bisphosphonates have been used frequently in adults, but there is no consensus on use for the treatment of osteoporosis in children. Uh, the main reason for this is that we have very few controlled studies available, um, and those that are available tend to be underpowered. So single site studies are extremely difficult to, uh, to complete just because most sites have very few patients with any particular diagnosis. And of course, any multi, large multi-center study is always difficult to fund. Um, so it's been quite difficult to get data um, for bisphosphonate therapy in children. Pomidronate is really the bisphosphonate that has been most studied in the pediatric population. The vast majority of the studies were conducted on children with uh, moderate to severe osteogenesis imperfecta. So it's unclear whether that data can be um, sort of stratified um, or uh, interpreted to use in children who have osteoporosis for different, uh, for different reasons. Um, interve intervention studies in children have generally been limited to case series or very small observational or case control studies. So at present, we don't really have sufficient data to recommend the use of bisphosphonates for primary prevention of fragility fractures in children. And they're very, very rarely used in children with low BMD who do not have a significant fracture history. Um, not every single child with chronic illness and symptomatic osteoporosis requires bisphosphonate therapy. So again, in children who we know maybe have spontaneously remitting risk factors or those who have adequate time to allow for the reshaping and remodeling of even vertebral fractures that they might have had previously, then maybe bisphosphonate therapy isn't indicated even in the setting of fragility fractures. Um, in general, bisphosphonates tend to be reserved for children with low trauma, fractures of the long bones or, of course, vertebral fractures um, who have risk factors that are very unlikely to be unremitting, such as children with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, and then, of course, we consider therapy much more strongly in any child who has a primary uh, heredi uh, hereditary bone fragility syndrome. Um, and then the other place that we sometimes will use them for a short period of time is if you have an older child who's peripubertal or maybe even in the late stages of puberty, who is less likely to be able to undergo reshaping of any vertebral bodies um, without intervention. So this is a picture of the classic dosing schema uh, for pomidronate in children, which is developed um, at Shriners Hospital for Children in Montreal. Um, and it involved using about nine milligrams per kilo per year of pomidronate, um, given either every two, from every two to every four months um, to children, depending on their age. 
Um, more recently, we've been using zolendronate as opposed to famidronate. So zolendronate tends to be about 100 times more potent than famidronate. You can see here that um, with the traditional dosing scheme of famidronate, kids would have to come in, of course, every two to four months, but then for three consecutive days, and um, the infusion takes about four hours to complete. Zolendronate, of course, we can give once every six months, um, and it's done in about 30 minutes. So for families, you can see how it'd be advantageous that that can be to use zolendronate. Um, direct comparison of the two agents has generally been pretty infrequent, actually, so most of this has been done just based on expert consensus. So there are a few randomized studies out there um, which do suggest that um, use of zolendronate is comparable to pomidronate in terms of increases in lumbar spine BMD. Um, of course, oral agents are available and they're frequently used in adults, but again, there's a paucity of data in children. So in one randomized placebo-controlled multicenter study of about 139 children with moderate to severe osteogenesis imperfecta, investigators assessed the response to lendronate over a two-year period as compared to placebo, with the primary endpoint being um, change in lumbar spine aerial BMDC scores. Um, and secondary endpoints were numerous, but included uh, the number of radiographically or investigator in identified fractures and change in cortical width of the iliac crest. So what they found was that there was actually significant improvement in the lumbar spine BMD scores in the alendronate uh, treated children as compared to placebo, but there was really no significant improvement in any of the secondary endpoints. So about 82% of the alendronate treated patients and 93% of the placebo treated patients sustained at least one investigator reported fracture. Um, and the p-value for the cumulative, cumulative in incidence of first investigator reported fracture improvement was about 0.07. So really there was no significant difference noted. So all in all, expert consensus is that IV agents are preferred in children as compared to oral agents. Um, just given that the preliminary studies haven't really demonstrated the same improvements in vertebra vertebral height or fracture rates as compared to children who are treated with IV bisphosphonate. So again, as far as how long children with bisphosphonate should remain on therapy, um, observational studies have really suggested that in those with persistent or permanent risk factors or disease, therapy should probably continue at least until linear growth was, has ceased. Um, early studies, they really used to recommend treating for only about three to four years just because the long-term effects of bisphosphonate therapy um, in growing children were very poorly understood. So more recently, we've been trying to treat until linear growth has ceased. Um, and this is really just to prevent the decrease in BMD that could occur after cessation of therapy. Additionally, in children who still have open epiphyses, and they're having ongoing endochondral bone formation. When you discontinue therapy, the, the new bone that's gonna be added at the growth plate is gonna be relatively lower bone mineral density than the treated bone, which you know, theoretically could increase your risk of junctional fractures. Um, and so that's been one of the other factors that kind of moved us towards treating until the end of linear growth. Um, but of course, you know, because bisphosphonates stay in the bone for so long, we're still not really 100% sure what the long-term implications of extended durations of therapy will be. And so current paradigms now suggest initially starting with a therapeutic regimen such as the nine milligrams per kilo per year dosing of comedronate. And then once um, fracture rates are stable or fractures are no longer occurring, then trying to transition to maintenance dosing therapies wherein you're using either lower doses of bisphosphonates, you're giving them less frequently, or perhaps both, depending on the child and their specific um, presentation. Um, and then in a child who has resolution of their risk factors prior to growth cessation, um, or who has, you know, remission of their disease, then it would be certainly acceptable to discontinue bisphosphonate therapy once you have a patient being fracture-free for anywhere from six to 12 months. Um, and then adverse events are quite similar um, in children, I think, as they are in adults. So in general, um, with IV bisphosphonates, you can have an acute phase reaction that occurs um, with fever, vomiting, um, 
and this is most commonly seen with the first exposure to IV bisphosphonates and generally does not recur with subsequent infusions. You can have mild hypocalcemia that occurs since this is an anti-resorptive agent. Um, this is much more pronounced after the first infusion, doesn't generally tend to recur. Oftentimes, children may be um, given uh, some calcium supplementation just maybe for the week or two prior to their infusion to try to prevent the hypocalcemia. Um, there is, of course, a theoret theoretical risk of delayed or impaired fracture healing that's been described, but it hasn't yet been demonstrated in the pediatric population. But delayed healing of osteotomy sites has been noted. Um, and so the recommendation would be that for anyone who's undergoing an osteotomy, they should not have um, a bisphosphonate infusion for at least three to four months prior to that osteotomy. Osteonecrosis of the jaw um, is a risk factor that has been described in the adults and it's quite well feared, but it's never actually been described in the pediatric population. Um, and then of course, bisphosphonates would be contraindicated in patients who have acute or chronic renal impairment. And then the last leg of this talk is gonna be um, about osteogenesis imperfecta. And this is a young man who's an actor who's been on several television shows um, and has been kind of open about the fact that he has osteogenesis imperfecta. Just a picture of him. So OI is a clinically heterogeneous uh, heritable disorder characterized by increased bone fragility with predisposition to fractures, low bone mass, bone deformities, and short stature. Um, it has highly variable presentations across the spectrum of severity and affects about one in every 10,000 to 20,000 uh, live births. It has a number of exoskeletal manifestations that we will kind of go through shortly. Um, so OI has actually been described throughout history across a number of cultures. Um, the case studies of individuals who likely had OI first began appearing in the medical literature in about the 1600s, um, and the term first actually appeared in the literature in about 1835. And then in 1979, Silence et al. published a paper that categorized OI into four major categories based on clinical phenotypes, um, and that's still the most widely used schema today for describing um, OI phenotypes. So this is a picture of uh, an infant who had osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, it's actually an Egyptian mummy dated circa about 1000 BC. And it was originally thought to have belonged to a monkey uh, until later on it was discovered that it was an infant with osteogenesis imperfecta. So I just thought that was interesting. So in 1983, Chu et al. described an internal deletion in a collagen gene implicated in osteogenesis imperfecta. We know about 90% of cases are caused by an autosomal dominant mutation in genes encoding type 1 collagen. That can be the COL1A1 or the COL1A2 um, <clears throat> gene. Um, the OI causing mutation in, collagens, in collagen genes may be quantitative or qualitative, um, with quantitative defects um, being caused by haploinsufficiency of COL1A1 and causing OI type 1. So up to now, about 1,500 mutations causing OI have been identified. 90% of them are in COL1A1 or 1A2. And so given just the number of mutations, genotype-phenotype correlation is, is very difficult. So briefly, um, this is a picture of type 1 collagen, which is a rigid rod-shaped molecule. It consists of two alpha-1 and one alpha-2 chains, um, and the three chains kind of come together to form a triple helix. Um, there are triplets of amino acids um, throughout this triple helix, which are held together, or, I'm sorry, which have a glycine at every third position. So glycine is actually the smallest amino acid. Um, and so anytime that glycine is substituted, it's very likely to result in a disruption of this um, triple helix molecule, essentially. So over the past decade, a number of non-collagenous OI causing mutations have actually been discovered. With two exceptions, these mutations cause recessive forms of OI as opposed to the classic autosomal dominant um, pattern of um, transmission. And recessive OI genes may be involved in collagen biosynthesis or perhaps in post-translational modification and processing. And this is just to give you an idea of sort of the number of different mutations out there that have been discovered 
So I wanted to take a minute just to talk about sort of the classic classification of osteogenesis imperfecta. Type 1 um, is the mildest form. Again, it's caused by a quantitative and not a qualitative defect in a type 1 collagen. Um, there's variable fracture risk present in these individuals. Um, they may have some intrauterine femoral bowing, some mild scoliosis. They tend to have normal stature, but they might be maybe a couple of inches shorter than you would expect for their genetic potential based on how tall their parents are. Um, and post-puberty, they tend to have a significant decrease in their fracture risk. They do have blue sclera, and they're at risk for adult onset deafness. Type 2 is the most uh, severe form of osteogenesis imperfecta. It's the perinatal lethal form, usually caused by sporadic mutations. There are often severe fractures anomalies at birth. Usually there are intrauterine fractures that occur. Um, it's not really uh, compatible with life, and usually um, mortality is caused by pulmonary hypoplasia or failure. Um, and children born uh, or parents who have a, children, a child with uh, the perinatal lethal form of, of OI really should have genetic counseling. So type 3 is the most severe form in surviving patients. They also often have fractures at birth or may have intrauterine fractures. They have a markedly decreased stature, um, distinct bases. Uh, they often have dentinogenesis imperfecta. They can have a grayish uh, tinge to their sclera. They can also have pulmonary disease, though perhaps not quite as severe as those with type 2. Uh, type 4 is a milder form of, type, uh, of OI as compared to type 3. They typically don't begin fracturing until they're toddling or walking. They can have moderate to severe short stature, mild to moderate scoliosis, uh, and they don't have blue or gray sclera. Um, so these are just some pictures of some of the findings you might expect. Um, so the picture of the infant at the top left is an infant with type 3 osteogenesis <clears throat> imperfecta. Um, you can see um, that there's rhizomelic shortening of the limbs, which is a shortening of the proximal part of the limbs. They have sort of a triangular facies. Um, and there's several fractures present um, on the radiographs. It's a picture of blue sclera, dentinogenesis imperfecta, um, and then <clears throat> this picture of the, the knee radiographs here on the right um, are demonstrating popcorn calcifications, which are radiographic changes noted in the epiphyses and metaphyses of long bones. And they occur because of disruption of the growth plate that occur in severe OI usually. So comorbidities um, and extraskeletal man manifestations can be present in OI. Hearing loss is amongst uh, one of the more common. So it can affect people with all salons types of OI, including uh, OI type 1, which is the most mild form. Um, you can have either conductive or sensory, neuro sensory neural hearing loss or combined hearing loss. Um, usually begins between the second to fourth decade of life. Um, treatment options generally would include a, a cochlear implant, of course, uh, if uh, someone has sensory neural hearing loss, or you could get a, st a stapedectomy, uh, which is only shown variable benefit. Cardiac manifestations are present, which include valvular insufficiency, aortic dilatation, atrial septal defects, amongst others. Valvular regurgitation is probably the most common, present in about 95% of cases. Um, in OI, in adults with OI, aortic dilatation is the most frequent valvular manifestation. Um, and there can also be diastolic function noted, dysfunction, I'm sorry. So dentinogenesis imperfecta um, occurs because of histologically abnormal dentin um, and odontoblastic dysfunction. The teeth can either look sort of yellowish brown, like in the picture I showed you earlier, or opalescent gray. Um, about 40 to 80 percent of those with the more moderate to severe types of OI um, can present with dentinogenesis imperfecta. And these children have a very high incidence of malocclusion and paction. Um, and they can have both delayed or accelerated tooth eruption. So pulmonary manifestations we've touched on are the most common cause of morbidity and mortality in OI. Um, and the effects have really been considered secondary just to the skeletal deformities um, and the scoliosis that they have, as well as rib fractures. Um, but there is some increasing evidence that there may be bone-independent pulmonary pathology as well. So do bisphosphonates actually use, uh, work in children who have osteogenesis imperfecta? Um, so studies have shown 
that um, in terms of BMD, there are significant increases noted in total body aerial BMD as well as that of the lumbar spine, um, and there is improved vertebral geometry. Um, there is an increased thickness of the cortex and number of trabeculae in terms of effects on long bone. Um, however, in spite of the improvement in aerial bone mineral density, no control trial has demonstrated decreased incidence of long bone fracture. Um, so initial observational studies were very promising, but none of the controlled studies or meta-analyses has really uh, supported those findings. Um, there's not any delay of initiation or progression of scoliosis. Um, there are anecdotal reports of pronounced decrease in pain, but again, this has not been demonstrated in control trials. Um, and then in terms of the effect on mobility, activity, and ADLs, again, anecdotal reports of improved mobility, um, but no control trial has demonstrated, um, has been able to reproduce those findings. Um, and this is just a picture where you can clearly see here that this is a child who, um, a young child who was treated with Amendronate for two years, and you can see that clearly there's a, a significant improvement in their cortical thickness. So as such, orthopedic surgery really remains the mainstay of treatment. Um, osteotomies of the long bones with placement of intramedullary rods um, are frequently required. Complications can include rod migration or non-union of osteotomies, um, and of course we talked about um, delaying use of bisphosphonates for several months prior to and perhaps even for a couple of months after surgery has been completed to allow for appropriate healing. Um, OI-related scoliosis really doesn't improve significantly with bracing, um, but there's been some success um, with halo traction and spine stabilization, um, and this is most effective if it's undertaken early. And then, of course, um, physical therapy and rehabilitation is extremely important, with the goal being to maximize gross motor functions and ADLs. Um, in general, because, you know, we've talked about there being such considerable phenotypic heterogeneity, there's not really one um, specific standard treatment model as far as physical therapy is concerned for children with osteogenesis imperfecta, and it's really important that um, therapy should be individualized for each patient, and it should really actively promote increased strength and mobility. Um, so early intervention, muscle strengthening, and aerobic conditioning are extremely important. There are a number of functional tests that have been modified and validated specifically for children with osteogenesis imperfecta. So if possible, sending a child to um, a center of excellence or a center that has um, uh, physical therapists who are familiar with treatment of OI would be beneficial, of course. Um, and then regular exercise at an appropriate intensity is required to maintain function. So ongoing physical therapy throughout life is extremely important. Um, and then very briefly, I just want to touch on some emerging therapies that are starting to be um, explored a little bit. So denosumab, as you all know, is a rank ligand inhibitor. It's really been used only in type uh, 6 OI, which has had a poor response, this should say to bisphosphonates, I'm sorry, a poor response to bisphosphonates. Um, it has been used in children, um, and there has been some increase in BMD um, and bone mineral density and mobility noted without any effect on longitudinal growth, but it's generally used um, on a compassionate basis in, in, in these cases. And then teriparatide, of course, is recombinant human PTH, um, which has shown some beneficial effect on BMD in adults. But unfortunately, in children, um, it's not been used and not likely to be used anytime soon just because of a theoretical risk of osteosarcoma. Um, so unfortunately, at this time, um, bisphosphonate therapy is still likely um, our best option for treatment of osteogenesis imperfecta and of osteoporosis in general. So in summary, it's imperative that medical practitioners be cognizant of the risk factors for bone disease in children. Screening for bone disease in an at-risk child is an important part of a child's overall care. No primary preventive medical therapies are currently recommended. Non-invasive and supportive therapies as well as orthopedic intervention remain a mainstay of treatment. And bisphosphonates remain the most commonly utilized medical therapy for treatment of osteoporosis in children but more controlled studies are needed to better understand available treatment mo modalities as well as to develop new ones. So I'm happy to take any questions, and then this is today's event code.
Um, so the primary endpoints tend to be um, ARL-BMD improvement, usually at the lumbar spine, and then usually yes, fracture rates. So are the fracture that high in children? They can be. So children with severe osteogenesis imperfecta, they can be extremely common. So especially if you have type 3, uh, they usually have fractures at birth. So they have intrauterine fractures, and even just with um, basic care and manipulation, they can fracture. Yeah, and then obviously, you know, there's significant phenotypic variability. So I've certainly seen kids who um, do very well for the first several years of life and don't fracture until they're kind of running around and trying to jump off of things. But then I certainly see kids who, who fracture, it seems like, just, just when you touch them. So can I ask you about vitamin D deficiency? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. So yes, of sir. course it's so prevalent in adults. I, I wonder whether there's sort of testing or guidelines about what to do in, in children and what what is the impact of vitamin D deficiency uh, so, in children. Yeah, so we don't necessarily so obviously we talked a little bit about infants who are being exclusively breastfed. We don't necessarily get vitamin D levels on them, but we just empirically treat them with with vitamin d supplementation generally about 400 iu per day um, and then um i don't you know i don't know that we have necessarily regular screening guidelines for vitamin d deficiency um, certainly if risk factors are identified um, so children for instance who have autism who tend to have a very specific diet maybe they don't tolerate um, dairy very well or just don't want to have it, then most pediatricians are likely to get a vitamin D level on, on them. As far as the guidelines for treatment, so I think similar to what we see in adults, so generally the goal would be to maintain a vitamin D level greater than about 30, especially in kids who have risk factors for osteoporosis or bone disease. The goal would be to certainly have vitamin D level greater than 30 um, nanograms per milliliter. Um, and as far as how we replace the vitamin D, it depends a little bit on the child's age. Um, so there's age-based dosing guidelines. So the younger infants generally are getting anywhere from about 400 to 600 IU. Um, and then older children, similar to adults, maybe about 1,000 to 2,000 IU daily would be kind of general maintenance therapy. Um, and then I'm not sure if you have any more specific questions about that. Well, I wonder if there are any outcome studies to show what kind of impact there is with any of these retreats. Um, just for vitamin D deficiency that's um, sort of isolated and not associated with rickets, I'm not sure, honestly. Thank you. Yep. So, um, adults, there's a concern about atypical femoral fractures in the respiratory view. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, apart from OI, which I understand is like normal. Yeah. Uh, in the other children, other than OI, uh, do you have to do class holidays? I know you talked about the temperature sure. and then all the things. So, right. so, even, so again, it's, it, it's difficult because most of the studies have been done in kids with OI, and we sort of try to transplant that data onto kids who have osteoporosis for different reasons. So initially, the recommendations were actually to treat only for about three to four years, even with children with OI, just because we really weren't sure what the long-term implications were, were going to be. It's only more recently that they're talking about treating for longer periods of time. But even that, currently, the guidelines are, you know, expert uh, recommendations really only recommend firmly treating until linear growth cessation. There's been some talk about treating beyond that point, but there's nothing concrete, honestly. So there hasn't been as much. There's been, there was the initial concern about atypical fractures in children as well. I don't think it's been described quite as much. There is, of course, the, the concern for junctional fractures in the children who are still growing, um, which is one of the reasons that they recommended continuing to treat throughout um, at least until the growth plates have fused. Um, I'm not sure in sort of older older children or adolescents um, if atypical fractures have been have been described, but not that I saw. It's less 
So, yeah, so now the recommendation would be to start with therapeutic doses, typically of, you know, if you're using pemidronate, for instance, that would be the nine milligrams per kilo per year. It tends to be dosed more frequently in the infants as compared to the older children, um, uh, but nine per kilo per year cumulative dose. Um, once you have some stabilization, so a reduction in fracture rate, or even if fractures have ceased, then the recommendation is actually go to go to maintenance therapy. So there's not any concrete guidelines about what maintenance therapy really is, but it's just doing lower doses or giving it less frequently or perhaps both. I think it probably would depend on that child's, um, how severe their, you know, their bone disease is and how frequently they're fracturing. So I've certainly seen um, pemidronate, sometimes we'll give it, only do it once every, like for one day every three months instead of doing it for three day, consecutive days every three months or four months. Um, or giving it consecutive days, but doing a lower dose than you might. So some of that is probably clinician preference or what the family can, um, is able to, to kind of do just because we don't have firm guidelines. There is, yeah, and that's part of, that was part of the reason again that such, yeah, such limited duration of therapy, even in kids with severe OI, was initially recommended recommended because we just don't we just don't know, and our studies are so tiny that we have very very little data about long term outcomes and safety. Is, um, so the joint practice, the mm -hmm. primary exam annual dose, mm -hmm. the adult OI patients. Mm -hmm. So in children, I saw that the Zomeda of the tonic is every six, so that's the different separation, right? Do you do that also? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, yeah, so I think about 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilo for the zolendronate. Mm -hmm. I think so, every six months. So, but it's only one day. How do you, how do you guys give it an adult? Uh, finally, guns. Oh, it's not weight based, right? Yeah. Probably in adults in that way, yeah. yeah. And then uh, the Zomeda, the Lindronic, which used mm -hmm. to be, they still use it for prostate cancer and breast cancer and metastasis, although they have, a lot of them have moved to the right mm -hmm. uh, Their dosing is different because it's every six months, the Lindronic, the Meta, which is different from the class. And they, their dosing is a little bit higher, I think. Okay. It's not five. So that that uh, I was just curious because I have some young adults with CF that I use, and then I always worry that maybe five is too much. <laughs> and I didn't go weight based because you know it's five and a half. Yeah, well, I could probably send you some papers, or okay. I can send you our dosing sample. I was just curious, yeah. and um, the final question I had was. Um, you know, when you go to some bone meetings, they talk about, like, when you talk about bone mass and children or young adults who haven't uh, peaked their bone mass, mm -hmm. like a piece of peak bone mass, yeah. they say not to use the osteoporosis definition yeah. rather than use it as a low mass bone mass. Yeah. High risk bone mass. So the the ISCD guidelines, actually, pediatric guidelines, actually firmly state that the word osteopenia and osteoporosis should not ever appear in a pediatric yeah. DEXA report. But, yeah, I was just wondering how yeah. the culture was because yeah. I'm trying to, try to <clears throat> refrain until I get to the kids, mm -hmm. uh, the young adults, now they all yeah. to me, they are in 20, so, <laughs> yeah. um, so till they approve, they are to the age mm -hmm. that they approve it. Yeah. So you had mentioned the height. Um, height adjusted Z-score. Height adjusted, mm -hmm. so uh, is there a way to, because we do see the adults, I don't think we have height adjusted. So the Children's Hospital has it in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Oh, Philly has it. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. No, 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 we all just use the Children's Hospital. It's just online. Okay. You can honestly Google, like, CHOP. Oh. Z score calculator okay. and it's just and yeah it's okay. it's available for anybody yeah, to because use. Because I struggle with the small frame young adults and especially the oriental uh, patients. Every, I feel like some of them get overdiagnosed based on that. Yeah. Even the T score patients. Yeah. So I just wonder about it. Yeah. Yep, it's available. So I think the NIH used to have one as well, and that one is it's no longer available. The CHOP still has one. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we we typically will hike. Um, 
calculate a height correct and c-score for every single child that will get a DEXA scan on. Yeah, no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I know. I'm 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 I